Yeah, yeah. Dr. Mohammed is asking very good questions, actually. There's, uh, uh, the timing is extremely important. And it's, uh, you know, there is, this, there is a rule of two weeks and we used to intervene in, uh, as a, because there is a big difference between the acute and the chronic DVT. You know? it's, uh, there is different approach in both. You can intervene for both. We intervene for chronic, venous, uh, for chronic DVT as well. The whole secret is in the dynamic of the thrombus itself, because what is starting as a jelly-like structure uh, or dough-like structure is changing within the first six weeks, and it's getting, you know, there is a lot of filaments later, and the thrombus is getting much harder to release, and it's very difficult to lyse it as well. So, uh, but what we found out that that even six weeks, so we usually go, with a thrombolysis and thrombectomy all, all the way up to six weeks. And uh, uh, there, are, there are data coming from the big centers as well that even like all the, all the thrombus you can tackle with the thrombolysis. But in general, it's accepted that within six weeks you can go for thrombolysis and thrombectomy. And if the patient for some reason is, uh, is, uh, has missed these this first two weeks, then you have to left it alone better because there is inflammatory phase within the first six weeks and the results, if you intervene with a stenting in this, uh, in this period of time, then you won't get the perfect result. I hope this is what you did ask, Dr. Mahan. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. There was another question. Let me Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. You're welcome. Dr. Mohammed Auda? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's an honor to uh, meet you in this uh, meeting, Mohammed uh, and Dr. Martin. Uh, about a patient with DBT uh, after uh, AV shunt for the upper limb, uh, does it uh, have the same uh, logic for uh, thrombolysis and uh, thrombectomy? And, uh, yeah, it's a perfect question again. This is an amazing platform because it's very obvious from your questions, you exactly know what you need to ask about. It's very much similar. It's very much similar. The difference is if the flow uh, patterns because there is a different, there is a different flow dynamic in, a di in the lower limbs and the upper limbs. But in general, I do exactly the same for the upper limbs. We have 200 patients on dialysis. So we do a lot of interventions for these patients. We have a lot of patients stented in, in the upper limbs and uh, uh, superior vena cava uh, syndrome. And it's basically the same within, you know, these patients are a bit easier to manage because you, you know, all these patients are dialyzed in our hospital. So if thrombosis happens, they are immediately referred to us. So we, we don't have any patients who is referred more than one week after thrombos thrombosis and one week is an amazing time you know that one week is perfect within one week you can get rid of the thrombus almost completely what you can do you know the just just keep on mind the thrombolysis for the venous thrombosis is, is is different than arterial thrombolysis you know the venous thrombolysis you can take it much easier easier you know there is there is never dramatic momentum like in arterial then you have to go very aggressive and very fast because otherwise you can lose the limb in the venous you have you can take your time so don't don't be hesitant to keep venous thrombolysis over 40 hours you don't need to go with one gram per, per hour. You can just take it easy. You can go with a half, half of this dose and keep always high volume of flow through the, through the sheet. That's the secret, not, not, not the concentration of the, of the thrombolytic agent, but the volume of the flow, because the flow is the secret of the success of the venous, of the venous uh, thrombolysis. Excellent, yes. excellent. That's and, really a uh, very good question, about, and I was amazed. Very nice answer, Professor Martin. Yes, Mohammed Aouda. Yes, another question, sorry. Uh, in patient with post-mastectomy and uh, the lymph node yeah. dissection is done, uh, we, they sometimes come with cellulitis and DVTs. Uh, the, uh, the outflow here is uh, compromised by the lymphatic obstruction. Is it, uh, what's your technique for management of this DVT? Is it direct uh, anticoagulation or thrombolysis? We, we send the regards to your kids. 
this way uh, <laughs> through the platform and uh, uh, it's an amazing question again i just i just love it this way so we have these patients as well because dr anatifa is dealing with many patients uh, with the breast cancers uh, this this all depends how severe is the clinic you know the clinical symptoms that thrombolysis i go always for thrombolysis because thrombolysis even if you don't recanalize the main vein completely the you know if you create the channel through the thrombus by thrombolysis the patient always improves in you know in clinical finding so don't be hesitant to start thrombolysis whatsoever unless there is very very strong contraindication like patient you know like three five days after surgery or or recent bleeding but the the contraindications uh, the contraindications for thrombolysis in the venous side where you pull where you push your catheter inside the thrombus to be very honest within last two years i haven't uh, contraindicated one single patient to thrombolysis because the venous thrombolysis you never have the bleeding complication your catheter is inside the thrombus and you insert through the catheter very low dose of thrombolytic agent you know the life the the half time of 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 the thrombolytic the agent is a couple of seconds, it's like 60 seconds. So I we haven't had one single patient who would develop like life-threatening complication. We had like maybe three, five bleeding around the sheet, you know, small bleeding here and there. But it's very difficult to manage, it's very easy to manage it, you know, it's not it's not a big deal. So don't be hesitant to start with thrombolysis. And if patient is not improving and he is uh, he is clinically bad, he's a massive edema, then just go ahead with stenting as well. And you can stand uh, across the axillary vein as well, you know. Uh, that's what I do for these patients. A quick question, yes, Professor you. Martin. You are only using RTPA for thrombolysis. No streptokinase, no urokinase, nothing. No, else. no, no, that right? no, no, no. Actylases. I use actylases for all because because I'm used to it and I can predict the complications rate. You know. Excellent. Excellent. So let me just move forward for the for the venous stenting because we are running out of time and I want to give you just a couple of messages about the stenting. So venous stenting in many cases is just unavailable. You know, it's uh, it's very difficult to get out with a good result without stenting. You have to keep on mind that you have to stand from healthy to healthy. This is un, you know, in, it's not. It's not like the arterials, arterial side. This venous, venous side is completely different playground, and you have to stand from healthy to healthy because otherwise you don't have a flow. You know, you have to keep on mind that the venous flow is very sluggish. If you don't stand all the way to the to the healthy segment, you don't have any flow inside the stand, and you will you will definitely encounter the instant thrombosis, early instant thrombosis. And I and I went through this stage, and I and I was treating like many patients in initial stage when I was hesitant to, to stand you know longer than necessary and then I was dealing with the thrombolysis inside a stand second or third day after the after the treatment because of early instant thrombosis. So it's a long standing don't don't be worried about the long standing especially in a pelvis because these veins they they were already thrombosed so you cannot do harm you know just be be sure that you are standing from healthy to healthy. And I just, I know that I was, it's a matter of money and then not everyone can afford it, especially in private, mm -hmm. but the I was is essential in, in recognizing the healthy segments uh, with a good yeah. flow. Yeah, and, this is uh, an important and, slide because Professor Martin have prepared the same questions for you after the lecture. Uh, and uh, hopefully, with, if with the permission of Professor Martin, we can upload this lecture on YouTube, so you can listen to it many times. But this is very important slide. C can you see my arrow on your slide, uh, Professor Martin? Yes, I can see that. Yes, so you also can use annotation during your presentation to show them what you want. And you can direct an arrow and put mark under the name. Uh, it's a very good teaching platform. Yeah, I will read perfect. the arrow. And we have to keep on mind that there is no ideal being a standard on market because the companies are trying to cope with it, but it's very difficult to manufacture the, the perfect Venus stand because the Venus stand, the Venus stand is difficult to fabricate. You need a huge radial force because you have compression from outside. You need a great flexibility because 
because you are you are uh, you need a long stenting through the iliac and femoral arteries, and they are very tortuous. And uh, you you need also a very high crash resistance. So it and and plus the, the diameter of the stent is very huge because you we don't put any smaller stent than 10, 12 milli. So it's very difficult to fabricate such a stent. There is no ideal stent yet. So as I told you, the 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 key and the, the main secret of of successful venous stenting is a good inflow. And uh, the good inflow is usually the deep femoral vein. So be sure you have a good inflow into, into the stent from the deep femoral vein. And always do the ultrasound after your stenting. Because if you have your sheet inside the stent and you shoot the venography, you are, shoot, you are pushing the contrast yourself inside the stent with your, with your sheet. What you have to do after removal of the sheet, you have to check the ultrasound. And if you are not happy with the inflow, then it's better to extend the stenting all the way beneath the ligament. <coughs> In case which, uh, which venous stent do you like, Professor Martin? I have used the Zilver Vena, Sinus, Optimed. Which one do you, do you think is is better at this stage? We have. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to you know to give like straight. Uh, advice in regard of the standing. We have started with a Cook uh, Silver Vena as well. The Cook is amazingly flexible stand, but it's shrinking in size during deployment, and it's very, very. It has very. It's, it has the lowest radial force. I will show you one. I will show you one. See, look at this. This is the. This is. These are the differences in between the stands in regard of the accuracy of deployment and the force shortening. Uh, this is uh, uh, you can see the silver and upper stands are on the lower side. Then I will show you these are the these are the stands in regard of flexibility. Flexibility, you know, it's so you need uh, you can see as you can see the coop is an amazingly flexible, but it ha it's having very very uh, low uh, radial force. So what I'm doing now. I'm using Vinova stands and I'm using the the Metronic uh, the Metronic Venus stand nowadays. Okay. Uh, this is, but you know, it's it always depends on on what you have uh, available as well. You know, so uh, uh, these are these are the the key factors. These are the key factors of the stenting. I want to show you uh, how do I manage chronic venous in, uh, chronic venous DVT because I. Uh, I have a patient like the young guy, which I showed you, uh, who was suffering for 10 years from post-thrombotic syndrome. In this case, the stenting itself is not enough because his problem was complete occlusion of the femoral veins and even the deep femoral veins. So in this case, I do hybrid procedure. I do endoflavectomy in a groin and, uh, and it's a, some kind of... Uh, the uh, deliberation procedure of, of removal of, of the chronic thrombus from the femoral vein. It's looking like in the arterectomy in arterial uh, bed, but this is the thrombus. This is open femoral vein with the thrombus inside. And you have to deliberate. See, this is the deep femoral vein. I'm removing the thrombus from the deep femoral vein. And that's the key factor. If you don't have a good inflow from the deep femoral vein, there won't be any flow inside the stent and you will encounter early thrombosis. This is how it looks like afterwards. And I, I finished the procedure with a patch and then through the patch immediately I inserted the sheet and we ended up uh, the procedure by stenting up the, the proximal part and, and look, at, look at the result. I told you how fast it works. It's like it's amazing how fast you will get the patient improved. You can still, still see the, there is still the dressing after the procedure. So this is something like two weeks afterwards and look at the size of the venous ulcer already healed in two weeks. It works amazingly because it's a hemodynamic. You open it up up there, you decrease the, the, the venous pressure down there and patient improve immediately. It's, it's, uh, this is the lady who was suffering from the chronic venous, uh, chronic venous thrombosis, untreated uh, in initial phase. She was, she was uh, wheelchair dependent on, uh, on uh, oral uh, painkillers. She was unable to walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is her. Your, uh, 
by the way, uh, your friend, uh, Professor Laszlo from UK, has joined our meeting. Uh, he is uh, your colleague in the European Board of Vascular Exam. Yeah, I'm happy having him. Yes. And this is Fatma. Uh, this is the first uh, first visit after the procedure, after the intervention. I was unable to recognize her when she came to my clinic walking with no stick because the the previous uh, visit in my clinic was on a wheelchair with the family members crying around. It's uh, <clears throat> this is not this supposed not to show you how good surgeons we are, but this supposed to encourage you because this is the result you can get uh, from the venous interventions. What is the most important is to realize that the venous is not exactly arterial. And there is like a couple of uh, big differences. The biggest difference is uh, starting with the with the initial uh, investigation. And it's very important that venography, if you are not used to it, is completely different than, than arterial angiography because in venography, sometimes you don't see anything. You know, this is the this is the arteriogram which shows you all the branches, and this is the venogram. When you can see just the collaterals, and uh, and the anatomy is uh, is uh, not obvious, the hemodynamical the, the hemodynamical significance uh, you can recognize by the collaterals mainly, and uh, and it's very important to use the IVOS in this case. The, you have to always have uh, the ultrasound on your side. And check the, the 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 flow, recognize the pathology and the extent of the of the of the pathology. The CT and the MRI is very limited in uh, you know it's 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 very good in planning the procedure, but during the procedure it's uh, you cannot use it. And, and you, during the procedure, what is the most important is the IVOS <laughs> because IVOS can give you the the best information about the sizing about the branches and about the patency of your of, of your veins unlike any other uh, any other tool okay so the the ultrasound you use for the for the identifying the, the pathology extent access and then it's the best uh, the best follow up uh, tool as well uh, but what i like the most is the ivos it's uh, it's uh, it's not easy to get used to it. You know, the eye was is not easy to operate, and it takes a lot of time to to get used to it to to be able to read it well. So uh, during the Venus Forum, we'll definitely organize the workshop with Patricia Torp, who, who will who will explain and educate uh, in regard of the of the specific. Uh, uh, I, uh, you know the spe specifics of the of the IVOS uh, evaluation and uh, and uh, how to use it uh, for the best benefit of of the patients. So as we as, as we mentioned before, the size matters. Everything is big, big balloons, big stents, high pressures. This was the the initial uh, failures of these procedures were because we were using what we are used to from the arterial side, but you know it doesn't work in the bed uh, in the venous bed, and you have to be brave enough to use everything big, and that's why I was it helps. And I can tell you from my experience, when you are in doubt, either to use 14 or 16 millimeters is usually 18, which is right, you know. So uh, uh, in, in regard of the chronic, chronic recanalizations, uh, uh, you have to use a lot of power and strength and, and steep wires and the catheters to recanalize the, the chronic venous occlusions. <coughs> The same uh, applies to the balloons. You have to use the atlas balloons, which are high pressure balloons, because these are fibrotic lesions. These are not atherosclerotic lesions. It's very difficult to push them aside. It's very, it's very painful. Uh, and I advise you to have anesthetists uh, on your side. And many of these procedures uh, I do under general anesthesia, unlike, you know, when initially, uh, we were discussing it's just a venous, you know, everything on the local. It doesn't apply really because, because especially the fibrotic and compression syndromes, fibrotic lesions, they are very painful during the ballooning and you need anesthetists 
to get the patient into deep sedation or even better you know when i when we do all the chronic venous reconstructions we do under general anesthesia because of because of this uh, painful momentum <coughs> We have treated almost 400 patients by now. By now, uh, we do acute and chronic venous occlusions. Uh, it's very important, you know. You cannot compromise in in a setup, as you can see. The ultrasound is always there. This is the angiogenic thrombectomy cut at the console. This is the IVUS always being there and a good and powerful uh, uh, C arm. And you can see the anesthetist is always uh, with us as well. Uh, and uh, this I want to share one one of my patients that at the end uh, the patient was diagnosed as a popliteal uh, thrombosis this is his IVC was patent and uh, he was admitted in one of the private hospitals in Bahrain and and he was put on low molecular weight heparins but very low dose and uh, he got worse he was in first 40 hours and he started to complain from shortness of breath. <coughs> so they, they did a CT and you can see the extent of the thrombus into the IVC and there was this, the floating, the floating component. So they got really scared and they contacted us and, and the patient was 40 years old engineer, very clever guy who was very much concerned about his life because uh, he read, uh, you know, he read a lot about it and he was afraid of pulmonary embolism and he was afraid from, from, from that. So they called us, we, we transferred the patient on Saturday, uh, put him on, uh, on bed and you can see the, the massive edema. He was uh, admitted on morphine, he was unable to walk and he was scared to death. So I told him what's, what we're gonna do. And he agreed for for aggressive approach. So the ultrasound guided tibial axis, and you can see the the complete thrombosis from popliteal all the way up. The iliac component was completely occluded, so the massive thrombosis all the way up to the renals. So I started with the angiogenic power pulse with the thrombectomy, and I was not happy with the result after thrombectomy, so I kept him for another. 12 uh, additional hours on thrombolysis in the ICU. After this, this is recanalized femoral <coughs> and recanalized iliac vein as well. But uh, this is a this is a tricky part of the venography that you cannot really recognize the compression, especially anterior posterior compression in a my turner point, because you see from you know anterior posterior and it looks like there is nothing here and this is when you need the the uh, the IVUS which can recognize the compression at this point and this was the case of this gentleman you can see the waste in the balloon it was almost completely occluded and uh, we stented up this segment and the patient was doing fine then and, and this is the trick i want to share with you because when i saw that when I saw this floating thrombus in his IVC and 40 years old young young gentleman, so I was also scared that during the manipulation he can embolize. So I will just get back. You can see here there is I inserted the wire from higher up. Here you can see the wire, and I inserted the wall stand from from the jugular approach at the level of the hepatal veins. And the wall stand is the only stand you can deploy and you can pull it backwards. So I, I semi-deploy the, the wall stand, as you can see here. Yeah, this is semi-deployed wall stand, which was functional as a, as a, as an IVC filter for during the procedure. And at the end of the procedure, I just suck out the thrombus from inside. And then I just pull back the, the stand uh, into the sheet and I pull it out. And, uh, and you can see this is the patient 12 hours after the procedure, the patient who came scared to death and uh, on wheelchair dependent and on morphine. In 12 hours, he was just smiling, happily walking around and, and he was discharged. And this happened one and a half years back and, and the patient is doing well. And, uh, and I keep him on anticoagulation. And I don't want to bother you any longer because it's been a long time anyway. And I want to thank to Dr. Mohammed.
Omar Al Farouk again uh, creating this amazing platform where we can all share, you know, the experience and uh, and uh, uh, and our, you know, I hope this is just a beginning of this this educational activity. It is, Omar, it's thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. So let us open the floor <laughs> for uh, discussion. If anyone have a question, uh, again, uh, please uh, raise your hand. And, and, and there will uh, there will be question even after this this evening because many of these questions we don't know how to answer, but uh, we know that we are on a good track, you know, in this in these procedures and. Uh, and I, I invite you all for the next uh, Middle East Venus Forum because it's a, it's a con it's a platform which is which is basically you know uh, reserved for the Venus pathologies and we'll be discussing in depth all the questions about the, the Venus pathologies. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. That was great. Uh, let us take uh, a couple of questions if we can. Um, let me start by uh, first question. Did you try the access of internal jugular vein in case of uh, chronic iliac vein occlusion? What do you think of this approach? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> chronic venous recanalizations uh, in general are very tricky, very, very demanding procedures. I always keep the venous uh, venous approach. Uh, I almost always start with the venous uh, with the jugular uh, sheet inserted because you almost always need it. You always need the approach from up and down. So the chronic venous uh, reconstructions, in general, I usually uh, perform from uh, three access points: bilateral, bilateral lower limbs, and the jugular as well. Excellent. Um, okay. Yeah, any any questions? Uh, any of the member would like to ask a question? Yes, Dr. Muhammad. May I? Yes, please. Yes, please, uh, Muhammad Awad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. It's a great honor to have you today. Uh, what about anticoagulation post procedure of thrombolysis? And uh, when you start it, and uh, for how long do you keep it? And uh, do you uh, use elastic stocking post procedure? Thank you. Yeah, it's perfect questions again. I use I like I love elastic stockings. I use compression stockings myself, you know. So I can I can tell from my personal experience that it's just it works perfectly. And again, it's a common sense, you know. The compression stockings just works basically against the gravity, and and it's a perfect support tool. And I advise the compression stockings for all my patients suffering from chronic venous insufficiency or or the DVT. In regard of anticoagulation, there is a lot of discussions, and uh, we usually have one session open only for anticoagulation alone. And there is still a lot of questions because, as I told you, there is still lack of randomized controlled trials for the DVT patients, you know, and new oral anticoagulation. I can just give you my my personal experience, opinion, and it's uh, what I usually start with is unfractional heparin for all my patients with very high dose. I don't, I don't mind uh, to go over, over 60, uh, 60 to 80 APTT and a high bolusis. And I keep the high bolusis even inside the operating theater. I usually check my ACT time and uh, I keep it over 250 to 300 seconds. And, uh, and I'm very, I'm very aggressive in, in full heparinization. And then, <clears throat> after successful procedure, I start warfarin the very much same same day. And I keep the, I keep, I keep breach uh, to warfarin uh, for like five days, and then go accordingly according the INR. And then uh, I keep the anticoagulation in cooperation with the hematologist because it always depends what was the trigger, what was the cause of DVT. So there are patients, they just need six weeks to three months and there are patients, they need a lifelong anticoagulation. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Martin, for your uh, great lecture. I have uh, a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, through the TBL uh, is how can you put your balloon or you just use it as an axis and uh, crossing the lesion? Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is like uh, the, this is a good question. So the the TBL is initial. I always start the diagnostic and thrombolysis through the TBL. And then, uh, uh, then all depends where is the lesion and what kind of, of tools you have, uh, you know, this uh, uh, available in your in your uh, in your uh, department because there are different different lengths of shafts of the balloons. So then you have to just combine the excesses. Okay. Another thing, if you cross the going alignment with a, with a stent. What kind of stent uh, you use? Is there a dedicated stent you use it for crossing the inguinal ligament? No, all the all the venous stents uh, are actually fabricated in a way that they're supposed to be extremely flexible. So they all, when they come to you, they all are saying that the, their stents are flexible enough and durable enough to cross the stent. What I'm using is the Vino uh, Silver Vena is good stent to cross the ligament with. But uh, after some time, you know, you have to follow these patients up very closely because the, all these stents are prone to fracture. And then you have to maintain the, the patency of the stent by ballooning or, or over stenting uh, the stent in case of fracture because it happens. There is still no ideal venous stent, unfortunately. And another question, Dr. Abdel. Uh, may I ask, bro? Uh, bro uh, thank you, Bro uh, Mohammed. Good uh, evening, everybody. Good evening, Bro uh, Martin. I uh, actually have two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, what is the procedure uh, if the perforation happened during venoplasty? What's your uh, procedure? Perforation. Yes. Yeah, perfect question again. So, uh, in general, in these venous procedures, especially when you start with venous procedures, uh, you know, when you are inflating the balloons and especially the high uh, high pressure balloons and you see rupturing these fibrotic sheets, you get scared. Uh, yes. And, uh, and so, but, uh, but I want to encourage you, I your, want to encourage you, uh, don't stop the procedure. Your, uh, don't be, experience. Don't be afraid yes. of rupture because the rupture is, uh, it definitely happens, you know, but in uh, in I I've never had a life threatening bleeding during the venous procedures, and the, and the whole secret is that the, and again it's because the uh, the specific specificity of the venous flow, you know, the venous in general the venous the flow itself always goes with a lower resistance. And uh, and if even if the pelvic vein rupture and you stent it up, the blood will never go outside the vein. It will go up to the heart because there is very low pressure there. You know, the the uh, in the atrium is is the pressure is zero, sometimes negative. The 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 heart is is literally sucking the venous blood. So you, even if you have a rupture and you stent it up. Uh, don't be afraid of, of fatal bleeding because it, it is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There is no there is no fatal bleeding risk in, in you know, uh, especially if, if this happens and you can see extravasation, just there is only one rule. You have to finish your procedure successfully. So you have to be sure that you will establish the good proximal flow. And then the blood flow will always go with a low resistance. To bleed outside into the pelvis, it's it's tamponated already, you know. So it's the blood is not going to extravasate. The blood will go into the IVC. Excellent. So we'll take last question uh, to Dr. Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Oh, Dr. Mohammed. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Mohammed. Thanks, Dr. Martin. Uh, my last question. It's about the use of the stent as a protection device, as you mentioned in the lecture, uh, during uh, listing of the balloon or listing of the stent, or any manipulation of the vein thrombosed for fear of the embolization to the lung. Uh, do you use it as a standard step, or we can you, uh, 
we can avoid it. Uh, what about the floating is a strong, but should we use it also or what should we do? Professor Martin. Professor Martin. Okay. Um, can I you think hear me now? Yes, can I can hear you? hear you now. Yes. I just I just want to answer this last question yes, because please. it's a great question again. So in this case, what I use the only stand you can use is a wall stand. There is no other stand you can use because the wall stand is the only one. It's the oldest stand, you know. The wall stand is the oldest of the oldest stand. It's a very different structure stand, but it's one of the best stands. So if you have available wall stands from Boston Scientific, don't be hesitant to use it because it's a great stand. Even so, it's the oldest one and it's not that fancy. And it's the only stand which you can semi-deploy it and you can pull it back into the sheet. All the other stands are not made this way. But, uh, but uh, there is a company, Straub, which is fabricating this kind of uh, uh, temporary IVC filter and it's looking exactly the same and it works the same the same way. It's a 10 French sheet uh, filter, which you, you just insert through the jugular X. It's very simple, it takes like three minutes. You inserted it uh, through the jugular approach, you just cross the atrium and, uh, and accommodate it into the proximal IVC, and then you, you are perfectly fine during the procedure. But I want to tell you one thing. Unless there is really big floating thrombus in the IVC, there is no indication for doing it because the pulmonary embolization during this procedure, if you keep the ACT very high with your heparin, is very, very unlikely. The, the, the risk of pulmonary embolization during this procedure is very low. Excellent. I would like to express my deepest thanks, uh, Professor Martin, for... Uh, such a great teaching uh, session on venous intervention. We'd like you to get us more of this fascinating topic and to share your vast experience with my junior colleagues. You always have this platform every Friday whenever you are free and we are, can organize it. I would like to thank you very much and thank my colleague. And I put the link for 10 questions. If you answer correct to more than seven, uh, questions, then uh, you can get a CME uh, hour for this activity. I wish you all the best. And thank you very uh, much for your thank you very much for your invitation. It's a it's a great platform. God bless you all, and thank you for for coming and spending this hour with us. And I'm looking forward to meet you all again. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, very much, Martin. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Okay.